yours, James. Right. Well, Rhys, thank you for the warm welcome. And it's fantastic to be here and just to share where we are with this major international project, which is happening right here in South Africa. And uh, Hiroshi and I are going to share this. Uh, Hiroshi is, in fact, the, 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 the leader of the program, and I'm one of the principal investigators on the, on the program. And so we will do this as a, as a two-man show over here. And this really, uh, just um, uh, three weeks ago, I was in Vienna and presenting the status report to the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program. That was part of a special session at the European Geosciences Union. And as you can see over here, this is uh, in order to get funding from the ICDP, and we've got a million dollars from them in order to drill these holes into active faults beneath mines or inside mines in South Africa. You need to show that you're addressing something of world importance and you put putting together an international consortium. So our international team includes, of course, Japan plays a big role. That's why I've made their, their flag the biggest. Over there. Thank you very much. But uh, I, one thing that was quite interesting uh, a couple of weeks ago was uh, taking down a Japanese visitor around. And you know, uh, along South African roads, you quite often see, he asked me, why are there these, so many Japanese flags next to the South African roads? Because those are the kind of things where they have high accident zone or danger zone. They have a red dot and a white field. I've never actually thought of it really? before. Well, uh, but I suppose you've, you've noticed it, Hiroshi. I. Yeah, I will watch. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have people from Switzerland, from the, the, the uh, from uh, Zurich, from the United States, from Germany, from Israel, from India, and Australia involved as part of our team addressing many of these things. And what we are doing over here is looking at the physics of, 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 of faulting. You know, what happens prior to an earthquake, during an earthquake, why do earthquakes stop? Why do the ruptures end? And these are first order questions which aren't surprisingly that well understood. One other part in the world where they've done a similar experiment has been in, uh, San, in, in um, California. And there's a famous experiment called the South a San Andreas Fault Observatory at Depth, where they drilled into the San Andreas Fault at the seismogenic depth of about three kilometers there. You can see the picture on the left. But of course, to get there, you had to drill a three or four kilometer deep hole. But what happened here in South Africa on um, the 5th of August 2014, there was the so-called Orkney earthquake, which occurred underneath Moab Kotsung mine. It was felt in Pretoria. It was felt in Johannesburg. It caused um, quite a lot of damage in a nearby town, and we'll show you pictures of that. And that occurred underneath the mine over there. And this gives us an opportunity to drill into a moderate-sized earthquake, a magnitude 5.5, uh, but we've got the advantage that we don't have to start from the surface. We could, in fact, stage our drilling from the bottom of the mine. And so we only had to drill maybe 800 meters in order to get into the, the fault zones. That was one of our, our selling points over here, that we could uh, look at that. But there were many interesting things to, to do with this. And we'll, pay, we'll get back to the details a little bit later on. But first, this is just the ICDP. They fund projects over here. As I said, they must be of international interest. And their main, and these are the main themes that they have over here. Things they do, they drill, for example, do research drill into ice sheets and into lakes in order to look at climate change. They do work related to volcanoes, to mineral resources. And our project fat, uh, uh, fell into two of the uh, themes, the one being active faulting and earthquake processes, which I think is quite obvious, but also quite interesting over here is that we also have a geomicrobiology uh, component over here. You find in our rock, which appears solid, three or four kilometers under the earth, there's a whole zoo down there. There's a whole microbe community there. And if you think about, and there are strange forms of life that have got completely different metabolisms to their life that lives in this critical zone, you know, plus minus 20 or 50 meters from the earth's surface. They eat sulfur, for example, and they live at and survive at temperatures of 60 or 70 degrees Celsius. And these are creatures that are believed that could be examples of forms of life that you could find on other planets, on Mars. And so it's an area of quite intensive research. So we have a team of microbiologists that work with us and have used our, whole, our borehole in order to sample life. So we might touch on that a little bit later. So we have these two components in this project. Just to give you a little bit of history, Hiroshi over here has been working in South Africa since 1994. So he spent many, many months here. We've done a great deal of research. And the work from 1994 to, I guess, the mid-2000s yielded some interesting results. And as a result, a South African bilateral experiment was set up 
and, and Hiroshi and I were the two principal investigators on this, and this involved perhaps 60 researchers, about 30 from South Africa, 30 from um, Japan, and of course we had great cooperation from the mining companies, from Anchor Gold, from Goldfields, from, um, as well, and these were some of the photographs from those, those days over here when we were doing that project. But it ended in 2015, and one of the sites during that experiment was at Mo Kutsung Mine, and that site was frankly a little bit of a disaster. Before you start an experiment, you speak to the geologists and the rock engineers as to where they plan to mine, because you want to then locate the fault, put your instruments in, get some baseline data before they start to tickle the fault, before they start to mine next to it. But at that particular mine, it turned out the geology was more complicated than they anticipated. And so they, in fact, changed their mining plan. And so we were getting very little data from, those, uh, from that. They weren't mining nearby, but we'd spent all our money. We left the instruments in there. And I think about three months before the end of the experiment, all of a sudden there was this magnitude five and a half earthquake underneath. And so it ended up being, in fact, exceptionally well recorded. Um, and, uh, and so that was the basis of this proposal. But you may ask, um, why do... Japanese come to South Africa to study earthquakes, and here's somebody who can give that answer, so you must come stand closer here so you can speak into the, okay. the microphone. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, Japan is an earthquake-rich country and disaster-rich country, uh, not only by uh, earthquake, um, but also by uh, volcano eruption and typhoons, but uh, the main interest is in uh, uh, earthquake research. Uh, because uh, uh, one of the uh, magnitude 7 earthquake, uh, Kobe earthquake, uh, killed uh, people of more than 6,400 people. And uh, the economic loss is great. And uh, another uh, um, disastrous earthquake was uh, in 2011, and which killed more than 20, 22,000 people. Uh, you may know uh, Fukushima number one flood, and this time uh, I had uh, I took a student uh, with, with me, um, Suzuki. Uh, can you can you stand? Uh, he's he was in Fukushima when uh, 20, uh, 2011 earthquake took place, and uh, he has a very strong motivation to understand earthquake and to yeah. mitigate uh, earthquake. That's the reason why he came to South Africa, not in Japan. Um, because <laughs> um, maybe uh, this is the uh, aftershocks and the fault system of the Kobe earthquake and the uh, uh, shaded area represent the aftershock distribution. Uh, lots of uh, that the scientific reading was uh, carried out, but uh, it didn't reach the aftershock zone, so we didn't know um, how uh, rupture stops at some depths. Another challenge is the uh, by the five, uh, fifty thousand ton uh, boat uh, with the uh, hundred meter high uh, drilling rig. Uh, they uh, drill holes from uh, the from the ocean bottom at the depth of uh, seven kilometers, uh, drilling uh, one kilometer, uh, intersecting the plate boundary, and uh, finding the smegmatite and uh, and found the uh, reason why uh, more than uh, fifty meter uh, slip uh, took place uh, in association with Tohoku earthquake, but. Uh, Maybe you can find hypocenter at greater depths and seismogenic zone in Shonin in Shonin Yero. So no information uh, was ever known with the scientific reading, but the uh, Okuni earthquake took place just beneath the Marco Sampai, and uh, we know uh, lots of the reading company uh, they can drill. Uh, to reach the uh, seismogenic zone. So uh, we made a plan with uh, South Africa people and uh, um, international researchers, uh, not only uh, from South Africa, uh, South Africa, but also US and Germany and Switzerland were very much interested in uh, joining the, uh, the program. That's the reason why uh, we started uh, the ring, uh, not only at Mokotan, but also Kukuho Mine and uh, Sabuka and uh, uh, Mine as well. Maybe, uh, can I uh, hand over you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, you. Yeah. 
Right, okay, a few comments you've got over there. Okay, you want to make a comment over there? Yeah. This lies a lot to be clear by me, so I don't know what comes <laughs> next. <laughs> okay, I didn't know that that was going on here, so I, I worked at the course, uh, but uh, I'm going to show you later. Yeah, um, after the, um, after the uh, Tohoku earthquake, uh, lots of uh, stations um, on, on, over the ocean was deployed. So now uh, we have much quicker tsunami uh, the warning. But uh, still, uh, we don't, we can, we cannot easily uh, reach the seismogenic zone. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a promise uh, a talk that Hiroshi has previously given that slide, so he was not entirely surprised. But of course, in South Africa, we've you know had great experience over the last century of doing work related to mine seismology, and quite a lot of it has been done here at the CSR uh, people here. And these are just some of them the ma major discoveries that have been made. But you know, I've been able to our mines provide us an underground laboratory where we can go and look at the rupture of rock. We can, and then this is a work a famous study done by Nick Gay and. Dave Ortlip, both who passed on, but where they actually persuaded the mine manager at ERPM to mine a drive following the fracture zone and see how it changed along there. And it's a famous paper called The Anatomy of a Fault Zone. So that gave an unusual opportunity. And here are some of the pictures of a fault zone. And here's this, and this was the rupture that led to about a magnitude three and a half earthquake. And it stretched for several hundred meters along here. But here you can see the complicated detail of a fault over here that's on a scale of um, decimeters over here. But the interesting thing is that these kind of phenomena scale over here, they are kind of fractal in nature. So you see, if you, you might be looking at something on a scale of kilometers or tens of kilometers, and the geometry really stays much the same. So this is the kind of work that has been previously done in South Africa. So this particular project over here, uh, where we are, uh, following that earthquake in 2015, 2040. We then put in a proposal over here. We motivated that this is an unusual opportunity to drill into a, a recent fault, and we, we can look at these phenomena. We had to, of course, uh, write proposals and approve the proposal, and eventually it was approved. And in 2018, we started with the, the drilling over here, and I'll show you pictures of the drilling rigs over here, the challenges that we had to do. And l last year, on the 1st of June in 2018, we completed the drilling exercise, and then, of course, now we're working on the analysis of the rock. And, of course, being an international team with many different scientists, we have to collaborate very carefully, uh, and so we don't... Uh, compete with each other, or if we're doing certain tests on rock that are destructive, we must make sure that all the non-destructive tests are done first. So it's a bit of a slow process, but we're well into it right now. Right, but just to go back into the history, this is the 5th of August 2014, there was a strong earthquake. The, you can see on the picture on the left-hand side, you can see the Vaal River over there, and the large green circle is the epi epicenter of the earthquake. That's the point where rupture initiated. Okay, and it's right there in the crook of the river, and, the, uh, and those other green dots are some of the aftershocks that occurred immediately after it. What happened at that time, the Council for Geoscience was running a 25-station strong motion seismic network in that area. So it gave us, and these are using accelerometers, so it was able to fully record the waveforms. Usually, if you're using seismometers, they're more sensitive instruments, and if you have a strong shaking, they saturate but they, this had been installed. So that gave us excellent recordings on the surface. And over here on the top right-hand side, you see a panel over there. You see the tail of the main event. And then you see in the first few minutes after that, you just see numerous aftershocks mm -hmm. taking place. And, uh, and down below here, and this is something that Rurashi is his own particular interest over here, so you can tell us why you had an Ishii strain meter and what it, or what it tells you. No, it is very sensitive, and uh, it works uh, as a broadband uh, seismic seismometer as well, and uh, it can uh, record the uh, stress change of course. Yeah. So just fortuitously, we had these strain meters in the mine workings close to the fault that we expected to slip. Not close to this fault, but yet it was uh, unusual to have very sensitive in instruments. Nearby, or a few 10 kilometers or so, is the township of Kumo, and there were was quite a lot of damage, minor damage caused like this, but it's still the total value of the damage. This was mostly plaster coming off walls, uh, walls falling, cantilever walls like that falling. One person on the surface was killed. He was uh, next to a, a wall that collapsed and fell on him. And nobody underground was killed. There were a few injuries underground. 
Um, and the total value of the damage has been estimated that it was 160 million rands worth of damage done to mostly in this township of Kuma, but also elsewhere in the area. Right. Now, this is a picture. Now, you'll see this is just a section through here. And um, what, ha what happened is we had on the top, you'll see the, some of the strong motion sensors on the surface. And then you'll see those red symbols over there, and that's the in-mine seismic network, which is run just continuously on any deep mine in South Africa where you have seismicity, you have a mine seismic system. So you have it on two levels, the, the, the upper level and the deeper part of the mine where the blue triangles are. And then this is just a plot of the aftershocks that were recorded. And so you can see plotted over here, uh, the, the brown square shows you where the main rupture occurred where it initiated. Okay, there, there, because that's what you get. Um, and then you see the immediate uh, foreshock. There's an event just shortly before that. And then you see numerous aftershocks are plotted over there. You can see over here in a period from uh, 5th of August 2014 to 29th of uh, May 2017, we had over 17,000 aftershocks recorded in here. But there's some very, and, and, and they're color coded according to the date. And what is very interesting to us uh, is over here that they're all concentrated over here on the south southeastern end. And in fact, in the area, and later on we were able to, and I haven't got this to show here, but invert the full seismogram of the main event and work out what the main rupture was and where it occurred. And it all it started pretty much where the main rupture started and then really just moved to the south southeast. And we got, Hiroshi, correct me, where the, I mean, the maximum slip was of the order of 5, 10, 15 centimeters, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, it depends on the uh, on, uh, yeah the people. Uh, yes, the on the people, model. But, uh, as usual. but we reckon yes. down there, you know, you had your major slip close to the main rupture, and then uh, another, uh, another rupture, uh, um, rupture spot was located beneath the putting site. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then it sort of stopped over there. But what was very curious for us is we were able to, this is just looking at in a longitudinal view, but we'll also show you uh, cross sections. They, they, they are form a very nice planar cluster. But when you project that up into your mine workings, um, there was no, and, and the clock stop is an area where there are big faults and dikes here. But the projection of these aftershocks didn't uh, you know, coincide with any major event. And also the rupture stopped before it came to the mine workings. And also something that's quite curious over here. Uh, well, uh, uh, is that normally with mining events, they are normal faults because nature is trying to close the void. They're driven by gravity. But this event here was a strike-slip event. So there were some very enigmatic things uh, of this. It was beneath the mining. It would have perhaps uh, been experienced some stress perturbation, but it was a strike-slip event, and it was not on any known major structure. In order to drill, of course, we have the, the tunnels down there, and the, but, but they, they've been used to mine, and, and, and that's the main business of the mine. So we had to, and we used contractors over here to blast for us a, uh, a room in order to put our drilling machine. And these are the machines that we used. We'll see the next picture is what is usually used for their long inclined boreholes. We had to use the contractor, but normally they're drilling to look for high pressure water or gas ahead of mining. And so they drilled at a sub horizontal angle, and you can load your drill rods in quite. Easily, but here we wanted to drill steeply, so we had to have head space, and so we had to blast out over here a six by six by six meter chamber. And of course, you're doing the three kilometer de depth, so you have to support it thoroughly over here so it doesn't itself uh, attract seismic events. So that was quite a major exercise to, to, to have that developed, and we used contractors to do that for us. Sorry, the, the, yes. This one is the second question uh, on your color scale on the previous one. <coughs> Uh, yeah. So you have got the 4th February event and the 9th May event. It's sort of a bit uh, not possible to see from here what the distinguishing thing is. But my question is, uh, did, was there any event on 4th February, 12th of October, which was recorded? And was it possible for them to, at that point of time, to estimate that this thing is actually probably going to lead to a major event on 29th of May? Okay, right. Uh, what we've got over here is the main shock occurred on the twenty on the fifth of August, twenty fourteen, and the aftershocks are from that date. And just this is the data set that we've got. We've of course continued recording. We still recorded today. It just happens it was until the twenty ninth of May, and the color codes just happened are, are not on the magnitude of the event. They've got to do with the, the, the 
the duration. Because later, I mean, when it happens. And so we were looking at the time evolution of this. And later on, and so we've done many analyses now on the on, on these aftershocks and also any foreshocks. Over here you can see there was an immediate foreshock. And Hiroshi, I mean, that, that wasn't particularly unusual or anything like I mean, we, we, it was not anything that you could say, well, we, it, it was giving us a warning. I mean, what would your opinion be? Yeah, um, it, it was a um, 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 typical uh, immediate foreshock. Yeah. yeah. With, the, with that information, it is not easy uh, to predict the main shock. Yeah. yeah. Just one second before. One second. Place. Yeah. yeah. And what was the magnitude of the foreshock? Can you remember? 3.7 or 3.7. Yeah, as far as I remember. Yeah, yeah. So it's a quite a large event, but not that unusual. So this is the cubby that we excavated, the drilling machine. And this is just some of the uh, analysis that has been done over here. Subsequently, you can see over here, 30,000 aftershocks. Um, uh, here you can look at a, uh, this is a, a looking at a longitudinal view. You can see the whole patch over here. We reckon the whole fault plane over which it ruptured might have been 20 square kilometers, you know, five, six kilometers along in one direction, four or five kilometers high. So it's a big area along which you have rupture. When you look at it now in a fault parallel view, of course, it might be undulated a little bit, but it forms quite a narrow zone over here. That's uh, along the, the rupture over here. So that's what we've been, and, and, and normally you, you regard your, your aftershocks are giving you an idea of where your rupture took place. But in fact, where the, most of the slip occurred, there's been relatively few aftershocks, which meant that part of the fault was well de-stressed. And it's really where it stopped, where you got a stress transfer, where the aftershocks have continued. Edgar? Um, while we're here, and let's ask a question which, which puzzles me a bit. I mean, if you look at... If you look at the mining in general, why do these things occur? They occur because we take out material, so um, the the crust is not in the balance anymore. So what does the crust want to do? It wants to do this, okay? So, but what is being shown here is that in fact you had like strike flow. Can you explain? Why this happens is that due to perhaps the um, the, the Mid Atlantic the pushing Africa up whatever and is there a component of that whatever why is it like this? Well, I'll try my answer, but Edgar, I noticed when you're asking the question, you're waving your hands a lot, and so in answering it, I'll also <laughs> wave my hands a lot. <laughs> but, you, you, you know, these are the forces acting on our subcontinent, as you know, the East African rift coming down, and there's one branch goes through Mozambique, there's the other branch that goes through Kariba and into the Okavango. You've got your mid-Atlantic ridges, you've also got your isostatic rebound as your continent gets eroded. You know, we've got the escarpment going around, you've got your Drakensberg, you've got your Okrabi's escarpment, and so it's trying to bob up a little bit. You also find localized areas of seismicity like a coffee fontaine and around Okrabi's, which you don't really know why, why it's there. So we've got, a, you know, there are a lot of ideas as to what, you know, but, but, and in a sense, when one looks, you know, we do get some natural tectonic activity in South Africa, and the sense of motion is more or less consistent with what you you get in an area of just diffuse, generalized, rather low-level seismic activity. But because it's low-level seismic activity doesn't mean you can't have a big event. We believe there was a magnitude 7.3, maybe 10,000 years ago along the Kango Fault. This is, uh, and maybe 100,000 years ago, there was perhaps even a magnitude 8 up in the Sotpansberg. So the, 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 the crust is in unstable equilibrium, and every now and again you can get uh, um, that doesn't count because on the Tango <laughs> and in the South Pontsburg, you have got these east west major yeah. also level, which, which is natural. But here, we're talking about the bits, okay? You're talking about a cemented conglomerate river, which, which is quite hard and some river. So, yeah, so in fact, <laughs> yeah, no, and that's one of the that's the enigma. One of the things that we are trying to understand, and we, we, we I don't know. Do you, do you know what really caused it? Have you got a better answer than me? Does South so African researcher ask me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that, we uh, we don't know uh, either, but uh, <laughs> we could carry out a stress measurement, and the interesting thing, the stress phase uh, of the was different from. Uh, the, uh, the first day, we don't like it, right? Mm. Yeah. 
people that are interested in fine. As if so a Western group has a different strategy. Yeah, is that related to a different strategy? Yes. Is yes. that a different stratigraphic unit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, center around, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, around South Africa, we've got a station, the, the Trignet station of GPS monuments, about 24 of them over the country. And really, and they've been running for about 10 years right now. But so far, you know, and they can measure movements of the order of one or two millimeters a year. But there's so far, there's not been significant relative movement between any of them. Of course, there's a bit of noise in that, but it's not got out of that, the, the noise ellipses here. So it's not as if we've got an active rifting zone that we can see from those GPS measurements. The whole, you know, continent is pretty much stable like that yeah so that's no, it's 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 a, a mystery so if you have a good idea we we open to ideas yeah just one question on the car you have uh, i think i think uh, the middle one is actually a blow up on the on the left yes and the right one is just a plan one right this is a this is a still a depth section Okay, okay, so this is the surface. These are still the same, the, the red geophones and the yeah, blue oh, oh, geophones. Yeah. But this is looking along the fault. So this is looking more in a, yeah. a north, northerly view. So you've seen how. So I see you have, have a dotted uh, circle there, which is like an anomalous zone. Yeah, that one. Okay. What, what, is that uh, something different, which you have seen in the latest one year, which doesn't coincide with the initial one month? Like, you see a correlation between the gray and the green dot, but that one yeah. sort of predominantly looks like. I mean, Hiroshi correctly, but this is these are um, the events that you get at the mining level. Yeah, mining. So yeah, this mining that would be related yeah. to to mining. Yeah, the uh, 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 dot to circle, uh, dot to circle events uh, correspond to the uh, plastic at uh, the development end. So yeah. that showed the rough uh, location at QLS. Yeah. So that was used to calibrate sure. the network. Isn't it? Yeah. So uh, these are just a few uh, of the pictures. This was work that was done a little while ago, but where it was uh, trying to invert for, for, for getting, the, uh, again, a fault normal view over here of the type of slip we got. So you see values of 10, 15 centimeters of slip due to that main event. But as Hiroshi said, you know, different workers using different techniques will come up with different figures. But certainly it would be in the range of between 5 and maybe 20, the maximum slip. It's not meters of slip that you got. But you imagine you've got huge masses of rock, huge volumes of rock, and if you move that, just 10 or 15 centimeters, there's large amounts of energy involved in, in, in moving that, that rock. So this is work done by Bill Ellsworth and his colleagues from Stanford University, part of the U.S. involvement in the, in the project. This is just another type of, of, uh, of work that was done over here, looking at each individual aftershock. You can work out parameters of this, this event in terms of the faulting mechanism, whether it's a normal mechanism or a strike-slip event. And these are the aftershocks, but you can see that there are areas over there where you continue to get strike-slip, other areas where you seem to get a transition to more a normal faulting mechanism. Uh, huh? Why are these numbers? These numbers down below here, over here, the previous slide. Okay, those are, that's the amount of slip in, in centimeters, centimeters that you, we reckon that occurred along the fault. So down here where it says 15, that means over here the rock on the one side and the other side slipped by 15 centimeters relative to each other. Yeah. Doris? So a very uneducated question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But if you had to look then at the accumulation of events prior to this event, this is then bringing this rock mass into equilibrium mm. with the stress that presumably would have been carried out, the strain that would have been carried yeah, out yeah. on the rock mass around where this event occurred mm. prior to the event in order to build up the strain that led to the stress. Have you done any work in looking at accumulation of the events in this area for a, an extended period prior to the event? And do you see a de deficit of strain in this area? Well, uh, you know, as I said, the trig net, you know, it's only very, been very recently comparatively that we've been doing these detailed strain measurements using trig net. And that's been running for 10 years. And we haven't yet been able to, over the whole of Southern Africa, been able to see any relative movement. Sorry, these are from 3D seismic. No, no, this is from the inverting the seismogram of the main event. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. So you, from that, you can work out, and you take it from all the different stations so you've can got. You, can you do the same thing prior to this event? Um, Unfortunately, no uh, data is but, uh, available. Uh, there is very few uh, earthquakes mm -hmm. as, as large as uh, this one. Oh, sorry. Presumably, it would be accumulation of a lot of small events. 
Yeah, no mm -hmm. suspect is fine. was located before. This no, was the case. Yeah, yes. only uh, immediate for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I've previously in other studies looked at prior to mining in Clarkstorp area, there's no record of, uh, you know, from historical records of any felt earthquake in this region prior to mining. I'm sure there would have been, but, but not that's, you know, but, but not in, in any written record, any account. You know, so for a century prior to this, I suppose when there are written records from, you know, there, there's no right. records. Is it not built up by a number of small things? No. I'm saying the area around us, because this yeah. would bring this local area into equilibrium with the area around it. Yeah, no, in the whole general region, there's a very low si natural seismicity here. And, uh, you know, the other parts of South Africa, even in, you know, further north into the Rustenburg region, where you get more tectonics, around Koffiefontein you do, but around Clarksdorf, there's very little natural seismicity, as far as we can see. Are you sort of recent, sort of taking the point? What's the scale here? Okay, the scale from left to right would be about, what, eight kilometers? Six kilometers? Yes. Yeah. That's a huge amount of information which is there, because you have got a very nice map of showing there, the 15 centimeters, the 5 centimeters, the 10 centimeters, the spices, the happens. So you can actually use this for more of understanding the geology and stuff. I don't know, I'm just looking at the scale and thinking about in terms of contours. Yes. Very informative data. I don't know. I don't want to see Because what, I mean, this is, your Russian said is just one example. Other people would invert, you work with geophysical inversion, and you know that you can get quite a few models that will give more or less the same result, but but still, it's, you know, you've got numerous seismic stations and you're trying to interpret as best you can every wiggle on the site's program, not just getting the energy or moment that was released, but every detail. <coughs> and is this amplitude related to a change in different stuff or orientation of the whole thing? Um, in, uh, no, not uh, not generally. I mean, it, it, we, we think that there were probably plots of spots on the fault plane that slipped quite easily, and then you have other spots which are called asperities, where which would have been like hooks where it had actually uh, hooked up. So you do get variations, but I think as far as we can see right now, it's, it's the, the, you know we, we can't map the fault plane very accurately. And I mean, with, with our boreholes, we've now got two intersections, and this is now twenty square kilometers, and we've got two holes this big going through it. So it's it's a, of course we write more proposals. Yeah, no, that's what we are busy doing. <laughs> but we don't want to spoil it. With, of course, with two points, you can always fit a straight line between it. But if you have a third point, it gets more compli <laughs> complicated. Yeah. So these are some of the stud games we've already been playing over here. This is looking at what we call the stress drop. When you look, And these are the aftershocks again over here. And we're looking at how these things vary spatially and in time. And in order to see how this fault plane, you could say, has been evolving afterwards, and hopefully from that, learning something about the physical properties. But this is very much ongoing work over here. But just over here, though, as I said before, the very you know mysterious thing over here is why this, did this earthquake with this unusual mechanism occur at this unusual depth, and what we're trying to show over here, at, at mining depths, it's normal to get normal faults. You know, it's, it says you know, nature's trying to close the void, but down below here we've got this strike slip event in an area where there's no major structure. And we've got it mapped very well above it. You know, so if there's any major fault, and there are big faults, there any major dike, we'd see it and nothing that we could find. But what we were fortunate to have, and here Charles Pretorius, you can, uh, via, uh, Russia, you, you know, you've been told people. You know, so he knows all about, but Anglo Gold did a lot of reconnaissance surveys over here, and in order before the deep mine over here, Mohab Kutsong was established, they did two 3D seismic surveys, and kindly they've given us the data to play with. Of course, when they uh, analyzed the, the data originally, their focus was on the mining horizon, but of course, if you want an image in the foot wall, of course, which wasn't so interesting to Charles and his crew, we've done a little bit of reprocessing to try to bring out that. And also been using some of these more recent signal processing tools, all these, they like to call seismic attribute analysis over here. And so we did our very best to see whether we could find a structure that in some way spatially correlated with the cluster of aftershocks. And I suppose this is our best and, and, and in addition to that, over here, we in fact have been looking at and trying to map the geometry of the different faults and the structures and get age relationships between these. And even this work continues, even just this last week, we've been in discussion with the geologist at Moab Kutsong, which is now owned by Harmony, and they're hoping and they've got an idea that there might be a block of mineable ore that's uh, been preserved between two of those faults, and they are sharing with us their latest drilling and mining information so we can further better calibrate our models and see whether we can, you know, there could be a block of mineable ore that's 
hidden between those those faults. So we are continuing to um, interpret the data and reprocess it over here, and we're using, of course, our geological information in order to get a better velocity model, and so we can be more confident as to where our aftershocks are actually located and to be sure of where our fault zone is. So you can see the different top mine zones, the middle mine zones, and of course there's an ore body which they call the deep mine zone, and whether or not that will ever be mined, well, it depends, I guess, on the gold price and Harmony's strategy. But this has now been a reprocessing that uh, Musa and his crew have been doing over here, and with some careful reprocessing at depth, it's been possible, and of course, whenever you have a show like this, you choose your best example and things like that to show, but we've now been able to pull out some structures over here which seem to align very nicely with the, the aftershock zone. So quite what it is, uh, well, we'll talk about that little, uh, a little bit later, but the seismics, and this is what, in fact, also one of the uh, really neat things about this experiment is we've, uh, you know, there have been a few of these uh, experiments done elsewhere in the world, like at the SAFOD, the Saf at Andreas Fault, and in New Zealand, but nowhere do they have anything mm -hmm. like this uh, kind of reflection seismic data, and so that's an important data set for us. But then, of course, as geophysicists, you know, whenever you've got a borehole, that you will go and do uh, not only map your geology, uh, your geological logs, but you'll do all your uh, geophysical logs, and there you can see the density log, and you can see a few points over here that have now, where we've done lab measurements of the uh, of the density, and we tend to do a whole lot more. We'll also be doing the electrical measurements and magnetic measurements, and then obviously your acoustic logs over here, your natural gamma counts as well. And so this is further information, and then you can see also over there where we've been mapping and uh, the, the fracture density, because this is very important in terms of um, of characterizing the rock mass. We intended to aim over here, hole A was our first hole, and we aimed for the fault zone over here, but you have limited control over your drilling over here. You know, this is a standard drilling uh, over here, and so the, uh, we were aiming like that, but it sort of drooped and went sideways, and uh, so we didn't intersect it at about 600 meters, but we kind of ended up running some parallel to it. And so that was very frustrating because every meter was costing us lots of money. And so we stopped and then we redrilled a hole B, which we changed the angle slightly and drilled more carefully and slowly, where we did intersect, uh, eventually intersect the hole. But drilling over here is not an easy process. It's, and these drills aren't very steerable. You can put in a wedge over here, but that will only deflect it by one degree uh, at most over here. And so what was also done, and perhaps Hiroshi, you can speak more about this, is our Japanese colleagues over here work developed some very ingenious techniques to measure stress along boreholes. In the past, there were techniques developed here that you would do down a short borehole where you'd glue a, set, a rosette of strain gauges on that and overcore it and you'd pull it out and you could then determine the stress of that uh, the rock in that rock mass. But that you could only do it perhaps at, at most 20 or 30 meters into the rock mass. And perhaps Hiroshi, you could make a comment or two about some of the techniques that we've now been using over here to determine stress down boreholes. Yeah, the principle is very easy and uh, simple. And uh, we just measure elastic uh, deformation in association, uh, in association with the drain. Um, in uh, an anisotropic stress field, uh, the rock mass is compressed in, in different way, and that is uh, that is the uh, that that can be the uh, manifested by the uh, ellipsoidal uh, expansion. Um, this facility uh, measures. Uh, uh, diameter difference is with the resolution of 0.01 micrometers. So uh, the, we can uh, see the sinusoidal uh, change in diameter. So that will be uh, able to, uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that can be uh, converted into the stress. So blue line corresponds to uh, stress change. Uh, assuming uh, the stress uh, at 98 level, uh, um, exact, uh, uh, actually uh, measured uh, by overcoring method. But our method uh, told, told us there is uh, some uh, tra transition uh, from the, the stress level on near the mining uh, near the mining level at about. Uh, uh, 100 to 200 meters, uh, circled by uh, circled by red. Um, the stress stage changed uh, drastically, 
And more interesting things is the stress uh, spiky uh, concentration at some uh, limited area uh, corresponding to the intrusive, high impedance uh, intrusives. And the more interesting things was the uh, findings of the uh, high pressure water at uh, 400 meters. So uh, we found the stress transition uh, from the mining level uh, to, uh, to below the mining level and the stress concentration as well. And uh, the deeper stress concentration uh, correspond to the upper fringe of the aftershocks. It is uh, also very much interesting. Yeah. And so, I mean, for us in South Africa, this is very important that we are, are, are transferring this technology. Of course, when you, you mine, you have to manage the stress. And how can you manage something if you can't measure it? And so this is new knowledge and ability that's been developed, uh, uh, transferred over here. Yeah. Before we move on from the previous the light green and the dark green, what's the difference between those and the cost of Okay, so that would be S velocity and P velocity. One question I have is then your acoustic impedance contrast when you did with the density and the velocity, did it actually conform with the reflectors on your 2D seismics? Yes. Okay. Yeah, 3D seismics. Oh, 3D seismics. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Another question, you may have heard it, I missed it. Any in parallel seismic recording, lateral seismic profile in the vertical seismic profile in that? No. In other words, to directly check. Uh, yeah. Hiroshi tried to put a hydrophone down the bottom of the hole. What happened there? Oh, I'm, I didn't uh, record uh, any <laughs> seismic event. Yeah. And the Japanese uh, yeah, and science so uh, society uh, doesn't support us a uh, lot. <laughs> so uh, we have proposed a lot of, uh, uh, of times, but uh, uh, we are still waiting for the approval. Yeah. <laughs> Cost we were quoted to put a borehole down there to enable us to just do passive recording or VSPs. It was yes, of yes. the order of half a million rand or something like that, and we blown all our budget having to do our half second hole. How much was it? Hmm? How much was the quotation more or less for to put the the, the recording size bomber down mm -hmm. the borehole? Mm -hmm. From yeah, um, I got the quotation only for the permanent. Yes, for a permanent. Yeah, yeah. It was um, it was. Two million, two million, yeah, yeah. No. yeah. Rands, yeah. And it was a, we did, our pockets weren't deep enough to, you know, yeah. to, but we'd love to. I mean, that would be the obvious thing to do is to. Yeah. Is the hole still open? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's. So if somebody has um, a telephone chain and. Uh, if somebody uh, kindly uh -huh. offered uh, the telephone chain with free of charge, it is pretty much appreciated. Oh, I, oh, I think Charles is suggesting an optic fiber, which is much greater, as could act as a geophone. For instance, the point, uh, yeah. now how far that would be great. Yeah. Uh, may also Yeah. <laughs> Right, and then other things, of course. Uh, I won't go. Let's let me skip over this. This is, um, uh, you know, other. No, let, uh, things that are used to calibrate the stress, of course, you look at the core in a lot of detail, see where it is disc, and that gives you some constraints on it. You also look at the dog earring, you put a televiewer down the borehole and see where it's dog eared, and that gives you further constraints. You look at your density of your fractures, and from that, and you also, there's another technique, you take samples, and each rock sample, in fact, has got a memory of the maximum stress it was um, exposed to. So you put it in the rock testing machine, and Bits University or any other place that's got a good rock testing machine, and you squeeze it, and you see that there's a change in the stress strain curve when you get to the previous peak stress that it had experienced. It starts to really squeak then, you know, it starts to take strain. And so you take all this information together, and you then can solve as you go down your borehole of the likely, you know, the stress tensor down your, your borehole. And so that's a very important technology that has come. Okay, Roshi, make some comments over here. This has got to do with the. Um, the, the, the water. Yeah. Um, and we found that the uh, temperature rise at about the 400 meters. And uh, DC also at Princeton University installed the uh, And uh, yeah. And maybe. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, 
Um, the FACA has got the four pipes, uh, one with uh, electric uh, signal uh, cable, uh, another uh, three is the sampling uh, line and uh, uh, pressure line and the pressure line and uh, the FACA inflating line. Um, huge uh, reels of uh, stainless pipe was uh, imported from uh, the US. Made, uh, made every effort to, uh, to have it at the, at the mine on, on time. And uh, can you see the salinity meter? Can you see 3H? It means a measurably high salinity. <laughs> so as your microbiologist uh, wonders why uh, such a, a high salinity work. So they are searching the microbes that, that can survive in the, such a high salinity uh, condition. Um, circumstance. And the uh, GFZ, uh, German uh, geo, uh, Geoscience uh, Institution, installed the gas uh, monitoring system. Uh, they are now uh, um, analyzing the uh, gas uh, chemical composition and isotope uh, analysis. I mean, part of the question when it comes to these extrema files is, you know, did life start on the surface over here and it's evolve? You know, to make its way deeper down, or is in fact did life start down there at five, six kilometers beneath the earth and work its way up to the surface? You know, and, and so there are some very fundamental questions that are being uh, researched over here. Um, and the thing about the salinity, that they, these our geomicrobiologists have been working in South Africa for the last, I guess, 20 years as well, particularly with colleagues from the Free State University, and they were quite excited when they got these very high saline. It's more saline than they'd ever discovered before, because the one risk was that the water would be sterile, that nothing could live there, but if something could live there, it was likely that it would be a, a you know, spectacularly evolved organism, and I believe they, have they found something there? I understand that they have found some life in that saline water. Uh, yesterday, TC told us uh, very few. Yes, very yeah. few. But, but yeah. uh, they still uh, search lives uh, because um, they have another site uh, with high salinity water. Mm. Um, and they found the biofilm there. Mm. So um, they may find something interesting. Yeah. So this site continues to monitor, continues to regularly sample water from deep down the borehole to see what they can get here. But now, uh, Hiroshi, perhaps take us through some of these most recent interesting discoveries over here. And um, let's perhaps just go over, over here. That would be a uh, skip to that slide. Yes. Uh, TC Olstott uh, installed a, tr a pressure transducer beyond the bucket and uh, uh, note the, the pressure range in uh, about the 10 uh, 10 MPA, and, uh, uh, and uh, it clearly uh, records the earth tide, and sometimes uh, some interesting change uh, also uh, is also recorded. Uh, we are now uh, trying to find the reason why we have uh, such a, a, a transient uh, change, and they expect some change in hydrogen or other uh, the gases that fuels microbes, and uh, they also expected uh, they also expect some uh, activation of the microbes and uh, microbe activity. And yeah, maybe uh, we will have the very good great news very soon. Yeah. So when we first saw the signal, well, well, perhaps you can see higher uh, than in the noise level for. You know, a few tens of minutes over there, we thought this might be due to a global earthquake that it was sending surface waves around the Earth. But we looked in our global catalog, there was nothing. You know, uh, you can see over here how it stands up. These are your daily Earth tides, the effects of the sun and the moon. And we get saw other odd ones over here. Here's another event where you clearly saw quite a sharp jump. But what they're sampling at here is at five-minute sampling intervals. So it's not like a seismogram. But you could see that jump, and then over a period of an hour or two, it eventually relaxed back and got into your general pattern. And this may be, you know, a kind of, a, and we looked in the mine seismic network, there was no evidence of any seismic event there, but it might be a slow earthquake, some slip that took place more gradually, but was enough to change your stress field in there and affect the, the pressure in the water. So these are curious things that we are trying to understand right now. Uh, may I add one yeah, thing? Yeah, sure. Um, before we start uh, drilling into this uh, seismogenic zone, uh, we had the great concern. If Water in Dolomite percolated into some structure uh, to, re uh, to reactivate the form. Mm. Um, but the pH of that water was different from the water of the Dolomite layer. 
And Turumai today uh, water doesn't have the salinity uh, as high as this one. And so uh, we were uh, relieved uh, to some extent. And the mine people uh, were very much relieved uh, really, uh, mm. to, to have this information. Yeah. One of the questions in these mines, every now and again you get, uh, I suppose, explosions due to flammable gases, methanes and all the higher order, th I suppose, uh, hydrocarbons. The question is, where do these come from? You know, could they have come down from your coal measures? Could they have come from your, these, uh, the, the, the carbon leader reef, which is like a bitumen? Or could it be primordial carbon that was formed, you know, came in when the earth was, was formed, you know, from the planetary matter? And so, again, by looking at these isotopes, it also gives us some clue as to where uh, these things will come from. So over here, you want to make any comment on this slide? This is something that we've been trying to do over here to try to get more information out of these. Well, um, my, my idea was wrong. TC told me. So <laughs> don't show, <laughs> okay, right. So just get to get to back to our drilling over here, you can see we drilled a hole A over there, it went sub-parallel, but in hindsight, you know, it's, it's interesting to get something that's just in the fringe of it. We've got hole B over here that we drilled, and there we got through an area where, we were, where the rock was quite fractured. We call it the core loss zone, trying to be very conservative and not say it's the fault zone, core loss zone over here. When you drill, you want to drill quite quickly, so you do double tube drilling, and then we retreated back. Once we thought we'd got through the fault, our money was running out, so we went through beyond it for about another 100 meters, and then we retreated, and we put in a wedge, and we drilled a whole C over here, which we drilled through a lot more slowly using triple core tube drilling where you can get all the crud out, all the fragments over here. And then our money ran out. And what we would love to do over here is to drill a few more deflections like this to have, you know, and, and the, the short hole, the whole sea was, what, 80 meters in the end. It was a relatively short hole. But drill a few more different angles to pepper that fault zone and see how, you know, how, what variation you get in an, in, in, a, in an area around here. And so, Hiroshi, do you want to make any more comments on here? No, no, you can speak uh, <laughs> much faster than I speak. <laughs> Maybe twice or three times, so please carry on. Yeah, please. okay. Uh, yeah. Right, but this is uh, basically, again, just showing the same sort of data that we're looking at and trying to understand and see what we get in the rock itself compared to the aftershocks. Now this, uh, and over here right now, all one and a half kilometers of core is laid out in the shed just across the parking area here in the CSR. So it's put down there in core trays, and we've been working through it over here. And this is the, the core loss zone over here, we get the broken core. And one thing that was very, very exciting over here is we looked at this in detail, and we wanted to look at the mineralogy of it, and um, uh, by doing X-ray diffraction, we found out that there's a significant component of talc and biotite over here. These are very low, uh, low friction and slip, as I say, strengthening materials. So, you know, this kind of, uh, and this is something quite uncommon to find uh, over here is talc uh, in the Witz Basin. We know talc can form from ultramafic rocks, from serpentinite, and you get soapstones here, but it's not unknown over here that you could get a more basic intrusion because, of course, your feeders to your fender's dorp you've got. You've got many. You've got lamprophyre dikes, which are a bit like kimberlites. You've got your pilonisberg dikes. You've got your karoo dikes. So you've got many intrusions that come through here. And it could just be that one of the dikes over here has subsequently had, you know, be, had some fluid moving along it and been undergoing through this low-grade metamorphism. So over here, one of the things we're busy working on, and Hiroshi, mm -hmm. the reason why he's here right now is to take... Uh, 100 meters of core and ship it back to Japan. He's busy selecting that, and there they've got a very advanced facility at Koichiro University, their core center, and that's a laboratory that's been set up to support the oceanic drilling program there to do advanced you know, studies on this, and some of our South African students will be going across to work in those labs as well to see what we can learn about the nature of the crown lava and the intrusives we find in here, and particularly here in the Cause that. You want to make any more comment on, on that yes, one, Hiroshi? Uh, talc, uh, talc is also farmed uh, at a uh, Seyfort pro uh, project. Uh, it, and the Seyfort project was uh, carried out at the creeping section of San Andreas Fort. That resolved the uh, mystery why uh, such a low uh, heat, uh, heat flow is, uh, is there. And, uh, no friction uh, on San Andreas uh, creeping zone was the mystery uh, over the years. Uh, so the same material was found in, uh, in the uh, mountain 5.5 of the fault. So it is quite uh, striking for us.
Yeah. So I guess we just try to be a bit conservative and not make it a bigger, too big a hypothesis out, out of just a single intersection through a ra- large fault plane. But this could be a, a key to the the mystery that there was just happened to be perhaps a minor structure, but which happened to be, you know, had, had been turned into into talc, and that might have been the the weak point, you know, where it was where this uh, this strain release was. Um, yeah, initiated. And, uh, in gold mines, everybody knows a uh, type is the hazardous uh, geological structure, but uh, nobody has uh, mentioned about talc. Mm. Yeah, I guess uh, so the talc may be found in uh, in in in, in dikes in gold mines because uh, most of the uh, type is uh, uh, consist uh, consist of the uh, dolerite, I think. Yeah. So what we need subsequently is we're going to look and sample some of the dikes that are exposed in the mine workings in Moab Kutsong and inspect them. But so far we've not found any other mm-hmm. talc occurrence. We've found pretty strong dikes that are welded to the quartzite. Not, 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 but of course you do get some dikes that are weak and particularly that lamprify dikes are known as running dikes and do fail. So, but, so this is just a picture in the core shed over here and you can just see you just sort it out and we're doing through many tests on the top you can see us doing our diametrical core diameter analysis over here and we're working through these things we also had shipped out from germany over here basically a very fancy photocopy machine where you put your core on here and it rotates it and takes a very high resolution scan of the core uh, perimeter because uh, the core outside and this is basic data we have to acquire this and quite a few of the students sitting here spent the christmas holidays with working in here doing the scanning meter by meter fitting it together like a jigsaw puzzle putting lines on it it was very tedious but very important work because this provides the basic visual record because all this core eventually is going to be stored in the national core library in the core sheds of the council of geoscience and if any researcher wants a particular piece of core you know it's not really feasible to always layer it out and redo it you want to have a visual record that you can keep so this had to be done first and it was quite tedious but absolutely important now we finished that and the scanner is back in germany and off to the next project but this is just an example of some of the things this is now a scan of the course uh, a core over here unwrapped so this side here fits on that side so that's the outer cylinder and you can see various fractures over here and so a, a straight fracture here at an angle will come out as a sinusoidal feature when you've unwrapped it just as you get with with borehole scans and then over here we took a Hiroshi's already taken some stuff back to the Kochi core center over here and put it in the medical systems from the CAT scanner. And would you like to tell us what you see there? Yeah. Um, when uh, we drilled into the uh, quarter zone and the, uh, the fold gouge zone, uh, we stuck uh, three. And uh, we had to fish a uh, dream about the dream crowd. Uh, CT value uh, correspond to the density and these uh, white material correspond to the broken uh, driving rods and the uh, uh, drilling crown. But uh, uh, except for uh, drilling uh, rods or drilling crown, a uh, very interesting uh, thing was uh, the material was also uh, uh We are going to compare uh, this result with the uh, uh, other uh, analysis. Uh, uh, we, we expect to find talc and biotite um, in this uh, in this material uh, in this sample as well. Yeah. So we're busy in the next few days. We'll be making some thin sections of these fragments, uh, both here in South Africa and in Japan, looking at them. Uh, you know, with the petrographic microscope, Lou Ash will be, will be helping us with that, and other people over here to study it in more more detail. Yes. Well, the top two images from the same interval. Yes, identical. Yes, identical. Yeah, so one is just an optical scan just of what you see outside the tube. And, of course, here where it's also fragmented, we've kept it in perspex, you know, in plastic, transparent plastic tube. So optically, that's all you, yeah. you photograph. It was optically scanned at the quotient there. And it was scanned in quotient quotient. And uh, so the uh, full gouge was shot uh, when I uh, took, took it with me. Uh, it was in my suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, long travels uh, shortened the uh, sport gauge, uh, gauge and it, 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 that's the reason why uh, you, you have some difference. Yeah. Okay, so really what we've achieved, you know, the, we've, this is a fantastic opportunity to do some pretty unique research over here. We've got three here. We've finished, let's say, our first stage of drilling, and I think really to try to get more funding, the questions we want to do is we have to show what we can uh, learn from this, and we've 
uh, and so we are busy now really in the phase of doing the analysis of it using you know, top instruments, top labs around the world. And this was, our, I suppose, our flagship project. But at the same time, there were several other uh, sites that we worked on at Cook Number 4, Bischoff near, near Western Area, and also Savuka Mine, uh, part of the old Western Deep Levels Mine, where there were faults quite close to the mining level, within a few tens of meters. So it was quite easy to drill into it. But the problem was, at Cook Number 4, the mine changed hands a couple of times and eventually closed. And so it was quite a challenge just to do the work after they'd stopped, after they'd stopped mining. And at Savuka number four, they had another major event, uh, quite a big event, about about magnitude three that caused quite a lot of uh, damage in the area where we were drilling. And so the mine managers stopped any further drilling operations. So we've got a certain amount of core, but we couldn't drill as much as we'd like to have done. So to do research underground is always a significant challenge, you know, you've got uh, to work on it. But we've got some other interesting results as well. And this is just some of the data, I won't go into detail, but from Cook number four, where we had, and this is just the seismicity that was occurring. Again, this is color code important to date. And as your face advanced down here, you've got intense seismic activity ahead of the, the mining. And this is as your mining and use stresses are forming ahead of the mining. We're able to observe that happening very accurately. Over here, it was a small area, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, where we had uh, 28 initially uh, uh, seism seismic stations or accelerometer stations, and so we were able to lake, locate our vents down with decimeter accuracy within, within 5 or 10 centimeters and really see how these fractures evolved ahead of mining. But then, of course, there were some known faults and unknown faults ahead of mining, and what we were hoping to do is we would be able to see those, those faults start to weaken and then uh, erupt to nucleate and then get an event that would be exciting but not deadly, Okay, so it's a bit of a game. But, um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, on the faults that we were observing, we didn't get a decent bigger than a magnitude one event. I mean, they were, they were always small, but a few hundred meters away where there was a magnitude two, or, you know, where we didn't have our dense observations. And so we didn't quite catch the, the beast that we wanted to see. We could see the beast starting to grow, but we couldn't see it, um, you know, you know uh, failing. So, but we've got lots of interesting information over here. And these are just, again, sections through here. The face would be on the left-hand side. And you can see how these different zones are forming over here ahead of mining. And one or the other of them, and we don't know why or how, but we might decide, sure, I can now coalesce and can make a breakthrough fault and then have a fault that will rupture over a few tens of meters or hundreds of meters and release a significant amount of, of energy. But what is very clear, and this is what you observe when you mine through, it's not, the rock is not uniformly fractured. You get very definitely, more or less evenly spaced fracture zones forming. But what you know in mining, if for some reason you get into what you call a hard patch and it doesn't continue to fracture in this way, you know that energy is building up the elastic energy, which could be released more violently. But to see these things, you need to have a lot more uh, I suppose focused, sensitive network than is normally used on a mine. I mean, just to do this on every stoke would be incredibly difficult. So really to come to the end, I mean, this has been a, and continues to be a major international effort. It's, you know, it's very exciting for us to have something here in South Africa that's of interest to people in, from all over the world and gives us access to some of the best technology, best scientists in the world to work with and to, and to learn from. So, I mean, we're hugely grateful to our Japanese colleagues in particular who have been pushing this and helping this and driving this for many Many years here. Yeah. No. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ray Hiroshi. Um, <laughs> are there any other questions? Sue, you've been very quiet. Uh, uh, just a, another naive question. Um, so presumably, this faulting and this movement was obviously going on before the establishment of your seismic network. And now you're talking about the talc being maybe where uh, the, the factor that caused the slip, so you say, okay, it's a zone of weakness. But could it not be the other way around, that the talc is a formation of the, is a result of the prolonged fracturing and movement along there, allowing for gaps to form, allowing for hydrothermal as the production of talc? Do you want to take a go, Hiroshi, at this? Um, I, I, I don't get uh, your question. So, yeah, okay, yes. so you say there's a tall vein, yes. and that allowed for friction, uh, that allowed for weakness that then yes, reduced yes. the faulting. But if the faulting carried on over a period of time, yes. then you'd have weakness there allowing for hydrothermal, allowing for the yes, production yes. of tall. So you could have it the other way around. 
Mm. Well, if it's fracturing, yeah. then hydrothermal, then salt. Yeah. Not mm. salt, then fracturing, then. Yeah, I mean, so the whole thing of cause and effect, chicken yeah. and the egg. But, of course, you, you, can't, you won't get the talc everywhere. You know, if it was yeah. just in quartzite. So it would have had to be in that, perhaps that weak zone on a rock that was conducive to being serpentinized or, you know, turned into talc. So, yeah. but, yeah, no, that's... Uh, Sue? So, uh, I mean, this kind of shows the importance of looking at the seismic data, you know, the 3D seismic data below where you're mining. Mm. And I'm wondering, um, have you seen any other structures that you, you think might also be active? Well, I think, you know, when you do these uh, attribute analysis tricks, you know, and you find one, I suppose, apparent uh, structure that aligns with it, but there are, in fact, quite a few others of a similar scale around there, whether or not they, you know, you, you know so, but whether or not they'd be occupied a, a by fault, you know, whether they are really capable, it's, it's hard to tell, but, but certainly, you know, for the mine manager now that he had a magnitude five and a half event under his mine in 2014, where he must... The, the, this is the kind of thing that he used to think about as they continue mining uh, for the next 10, 20 years, whatever the life of that mine is, that something like this could could recur. What do you... And, and is this structure showing up on any other data or... Um, when you look at the... At, at Era Mag, of course, that will my, you can map your dikes beautifully, but that's on, on, on the surface. And, and generally, the trend of the structure is similar to the regional trend of the of some of the dikes you find in that area. Yes, but it's... Yeah. That penetrates into the problem. And so yes. the, the susceptibilities might be able to be used to... Yes, and so that's one of the things that you involved with and we hope yeah. to be doing over the next couple of weeks is to see if we can <laughs> correlate these, these things. And, yeah. Now perhaps just a comment on Rob's point is, are you thinking about or perhaps like a date in my fashion? Yeah, it relates to the... The talk is the precursor of the seismic event or after the seismic event. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because certainly this whole thing's been going on from a certain period. So mm. you could then date the talk and say, the top there before. Yeah. Yes. Um, there are a family of types uh, on mining horizon and uh, geologists of the mine and <coughs> found, uh, horizontal slip inside. So that is the evidence of the previous um, very old uh, activity. So uh, there should be some uh, pre existing uh, weakness uh, with top. Mm. But uh, you know, Rob, you, 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 you're right in that one. Can use methods like argon, argon to date micas that form and try to get some handle on the most recent tectonic event or something. And that's something, in fact, we haven't got in our plan, but we has been done on other faults in the Witz basin. And maybe it's, I guess we tend to focus a little bit on the on the rock mechanics and the seismics. But that, yeah. Okay, you might just comment on the talk issue. Um, in my own small. The gold mine, whatever, which is in the previous um, talk, the Senate view, whatever. Um, there is lots of sea talc, whatever, in the, in the conglomerate. Um, um, I was surprised, you know, I, to this day, I don't understand where this comes from. Very interesting, I don't know that. And yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, if you. If you walk around the old, um, I'm talking about the, the really old rock dumps, you know, the ones from um, 1911, you know, the, the, that sort of period. So you can pick up whatever these, these, um, that you even have uh, these foot site uh, shifts and things, whatever. I always thought, you know, because it was of the depth of burial or whatever that that the the, the, the bits underwent or whatever and um, uh, the, 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 which we're now exposing you know so it's 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 uh, yeah and and uh, um, um, if you go into the old workings there are lots of flecks of uh, uh, of talk and things whatever this was at least a decade that actually she's uh, researching the, the origin of gold over here, and of course, mm -hmm. one of the ideas the classic gold would have come from the old granite greenstone belt. Yes, yes. So maybe these That's, would have yeah. been fragments of yes. you know the greenstone that have now kind of yeah. decomposed. I yeah, suppose yeah, that yeah, would be yeah. waving my arms around. But yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, Oleg, okay. sorry, could you go back to a couple of slides? Hmm. My question <laughs> basically just relates to the case that yeah, so two more, two, two, forward, two forward, yeah. That's right. So this data set that you explained in basically the bottom 
middle section, right? Yeah. How many data points does it have? This one, um, 20, 220,000 in, 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 in <laughs> a seismic event in, in, in six weeks or something like that, from 17th of August to 23rd of September. Five weeks, 223,000. 200,000 events. That, that's perfect. Have you thought about applying any machine learning uh, neural networks to basically analyze <laughs> the data? Yeah, we have thought, of, in fact, that you, of using machine learning generally in terms of mind seismicity. In fact, the overwhelming number of those would be, you know, just due to as you mine the fractures forming, these are very small ones, but yeah, no, we have, in, in fact, that's one of the projects in, in terms of, you know, here at uh, there's this uh, at the Mandela Mining Precinct. One of the initiatives was the South Africa Murdy project over here. There's Fatila at the back okay. there, and one of the issue, one of the ideas, and also we at Vitzo are talking to the mining companies separately, and particularly Amber Gold has expressed some interest in using machine learning, and this would be more in collaboration with the IBM laboratory uh, at Chimolohong to apply some machine learning to see what trends we could pick out of these huge numbers. I mean, here again, there's no ways if, if, to, to interpret and pick. You know, the, the first arrivals by hand on 222,000 event would keep an army of analysts busy for years. Yeah. And here again, our Japanese colleagues have come up with some very smart algorithms to do automatic pickings and associations and find out which are uh, legitimate, you know, events that can be associated with a single event. So that's another bit of technology which has been imported to South Africa and now is now used at the, at the Council of Geoscience. Yeah, from the, from the point of the uh, hazard mitigation, uh, response to blasting will be included. But uh, unfortunately, this uh, sensitive system doesn't record blasting associated uh, clocking at all because then uh, too many earthquakes uh, takes place at, at the same time. It is very difficult to associate. So um, machine learning uh, with uh, is very powerful, but uh, uh, we may be, we, we may have to find the best way to uh, integrate data just after the blasting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Charles, just a general question. I suppose uh, what Rhys was asking earlier on. Now, with all of this data, now have you related the um, the seismicity history? With structures that you three dimensionally mapped on the seismics. And that's something you can do, because those data sets are there. There's the Venus sort of mapping of proximity of mining as it approaches structures. If you're reprocessing the seismics, that's all going to be But have there been any new structural models to come up? Have there been a look and things like the running dikes? As, uh, you know, the, uh, the difference is because, as you know, the running dikes are quite problematic north of the northwest of here. What's the relationship between them and their lights up? Well, don't light up, but I don't remember on the on the Aeroman mm -hmm. very well. It's, we've done studies, I remember from my class, but relating time slices in the side to the uh, dips of those sites. Have there been any sort of regional studies bringing the seismicity in and then taking time snapshots? And, you know, what with their particular approach to these structures or proximity to these structures that had something to do with the time of this event? I can say this particular study, no, because I think we've got kind of more than enough to do right now. Yeah, we, yeah. But I think you know what you're saying is is, is great, and maybe and we perhaps need to to do to do that. You yeah. know, but but up till now, no, we've tried to do it on, on other mines and other areas, but not with this fantastic data set. No. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a simpler question is, given the strain that happened during this 5.5 event, yeah. do you know what time interval it took for that stress to build up? Um, what is the technique, uh, tectonic strain rate in South Africa? Very, very low, not very, very low. Yeah, I suppose is what I'm saying. Currently, with our GPS networks over 10 years, we have not yet been able to, you know, find, you know, a measurable distortion yet in that time. So mm -hmm. we don't know. Really, it's very, very low. The whole of Southern Africa, you know, while you are getting some seismicity in that, but is over the period that we've got accurate measurements is acting pretty much like a rigid block. But maybe as our, instrument, our measurements become more accurate or we have a longer time history, you might be able to start to see you know, how they, it's deformed. But currently, it's kind of all moving as a, <coughs> as a block. <laughs> you know, it moves up and down and things like that yeah. to earth tides and things. There's continual flexure taking place, which is measurable, but, but there's, not you, there's not yet any measurable... Net. 
uh, you know, across the East African Rift, you know, with this uh, Africa Ray, we've got GPS sensors in there. You can see you're moving a, a part of, you know, at 14 milli, you know, 20 millimeters a year. You know, it is measurable there. But within Southern Africa, so far, we're not getting out of the noise. You know, and yeah. nothing that could be done with the 3D networks on the mines. Um, they did. I mean, they focused on the mine seismology over mm. here, so they tuned into, you know, that's the focus of their measurements. So you, and that's why when Hiroshi brought his strain gauges in here, which are very sensitive to these slow, non-seismic, you know, creeping events, they were very important, but they are not things that are routinely deployed. They're very sensitive and very expensive to, to operate. Any other questions? In that case, thank you. Ray, thank you, Hiroshi. The beautiful thing with wine is you can share it. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. I love South Africa and wine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, please join us outside for a few more drinks. Thank you. Come. Do you want to find the bridge? 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 Do you want to find the bridge?